uh, I'm John Slattery. I'm the Vice Dean for Research and Graduate Education in the School of Medicine. And on behalf of the uh, Council on Research and Graduate Education, it's really a pleasure to um, uh, welcome you to the SIM lecture this afternoon that will be um, given by uh, Joseph Mujo. Um, he's reminded me that his name uh, rhymes with Peugeot. Uh, um, I, I also want to put in um, a little commercial here that Corge is soliciting nominations for next year's uh, SIM series. If you haven't seen that announcement but would like to nominate somebody, uh, please just send your nomination to me. My uh, email address is jts uh, at uw.edu. Um, and I'll be sure to get that uh, onto the Council on Research and Graduate edu Education. It's really a pleasure to um, um, introduce Joseph today. I, I first met Joseph, I think, as he was uh, being interviewed for and uh, uh, for his initial position as assistant professor in the Department of Microbiology. And um, it's good that my uh, chat with him then didn't discourage him. Uh, because he uh, subsequently joined uh, us here at the University of Washington and has just done outstanding work. And, and it's, we're um, very pleased, blessed that, that uh, he joined us. He is uh, a local kid. He was born in Aberdeen, Washington. He did his uh, BS in biochemistry from uh, Western Washington uh, University and then um, ran away to California. Uh, for his PhD, which was in molecular and cellular biology at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, he, following that, he did a postdoc at uh, Harvard, uh, came back home, uh, joined us as an assistant professor in the Department of Microbiology uh, in 2008, and he's gone through the ranks here, and currently he's um, a professor in the Department of Microbiology with an adjunct appointment in biochemistry, and he's active and a member of both the uh, molecular and cellular biology programs and the uh, nanotechnology program. Um, he's uh, received quite a lot of uh, recognition. Um, he was named an HHMI investigator in 2015. Uh, and just uh, this year in January, uh, he's received the National Academy of Sciences Awards in uh, molecular biology, which is uh, um, quite, quite an accomplishment and recognition. Uh, the goal of Joseph's work has been to identify, characterize, uh, and exploit pathways that bacteria use for intracellular communication and, and competition. And today he's going to be discussing um, his laboratory's recent progress towards understanding the diversity of mechanisms uh, by which antibacterial toxins enter and act upon recipient cells, as well as the impact of interbacterial antagonism on, microbiolo uh, bi on microbial communities and bacterial evolution. Uh, the title is uh, Big Consequences of Microscale Warfare. That sounded kind of violent when I first heard it, but certainly looking forward to the talk. Joseph, please take it away. Sorry about that. Thank you, John. <laughs> I guess I'll just uh, jump right in. Um, so, so in today's talk, um, I'll start with some background, uh, which I realize turns out to be two or three slides that effectively summarize the first 10 years of our lab's work here at UW. And then I'll tell you uh, a short story about why bacteria use the toxins that they do against other bacteria. And after that, I'll share with you a story that includes a foray into eukaryotic genome editing technology. And finally, I'll wrap up with some concluding remarks. Um, my hope is that I'll be able to keep this talk under 40 minutes so everyone can go out and enjoy the sun and their lunches. Okay. So when I joined the faculty here at UW, um, I had a pretty singular mission figure out what this set of neighboring genes in the gram-negative bacterium Pseudomonas aeruginosa does for the bug. <clears throat> and I won't go into why we thought this, but suffice to say that we thought the proteins encoded by these genes assembled into a protein secretion system. And furthermore, we thought that the substrates of this system 
of which there were none known at the time, were likely to be secreted into eukaryotic host cells. Well, we, we did find substrates eventually, uh, but it turns out that the proteins secreted by this uh, system are in fact not delivered into eukaryotic cells. <clears throat> what we discovered instead, uh, much to our surprise, is that the secretion system, which we refer to as the type six secretion system, delivers its substrates into other bacteria. Furthermore, we found that the substrates of the system are actually highly toxic and antibacterial proteins. Using a type six secretion system, a bacterium is able to more effectively compete with the cell it is in immediate contact with. And here are micrographs showing two bacterial strains falsely colored the same as our toxin donor strain here in purple and our toxin recipient in green. At time zero, these strains are mixed one to one. And after just six hours, you can see that the recipient strain is vastly diminished in the population. This, um, this ability of the purple strain to outcompete the green strain is entirely due to the toxins delivered by its type six secretion system. Over the years, we've learned um, quite a lot about how mechanistically this secretion system is able to mediate the destruction of target cells. Um, while many researchers focus on the secretion system itself, our lab is focused on the toxins that it exports. And zooming in um, on what's happening in the green cell here, we found um, target cells are killed using a wide range of activities, including by degrading cell membranes via phospholipase activity, by cleaving up the cell wall and thus leaving cells without a way to resist turgor pressure, by punching holes in membranes and thereby collapsing the proton motive force, and by acting in the cytoplasm to degrade NAD or inhibit cell division. What's common to all the processes targeted by type six secretion toxins is that they are essential and difficult for cells to evolve resistance against. A typical type six secretion system will deliver a whole cocktail of toxins such as these that effectively dismantle the target cell. Before moving on to more recent stories from the lab, I wanted to put the findings I just told you about in context and also discuss the implications as we currently understand them. The type six secretion system has been found now in thousands of bacteria. And since our initial results, it has been demonstrated, to, de demonstrated experimentally to act as a contact dependent in interbacterial toxin delivery system in probably approaching hundred species or more. I have some of those shown down here, and I wanna emphasize that this is the work of many, many research labs worldwide. You can see that um, a wide range of bacteria use this system to antagonize other bacteria. You have bacteria that live in the rhizosphere, like the biocontrol strain Pseudomonas fluorescens, bacteria that are host-associated commensals like Bacteroides fragilis, and pathogens such as Acinetobacter baumoniae, Peromonas hydrophila, and Vibrio cholera. And I think this underscores just how polymicrobial most natural hab habitats are and how competitive and cutthroat things are at the micron scale. I also wanted to highlight um, a couple of specific examples from the literature that I think best show the range of physiological roles this antibacterial system plays. Vibrio fisheri are marine bacteria that colonize a special light organ of the Hawaiian bobtail squid. They use their type six secretion system to fend off other strains, ensuring a single clonal strain makes it into this exclusive niche. Agrobacterium tumefaciens is a plant-associated bacteria that uses its type six secretion system to outcompete other bacteria and colonize plants. Finally, uh, Bacteroides are associated with the mammalian gut and use their type six secretion system to antagonize other Bacteroides species, which we think uh, somewhat paradoxically actually lends stability to the microbiome. Okay, so moving on to some more uh, recent stories from the lab. Um, recall, I told you that bacteria tend to export a cocktail of toxins into other bacteria. In this, um, in this first short story I wanted to tell you about, we asked, why do bacteria deliver the particular toxins that they do? And it turns out that delivering a diverse uh, toxin cocktail is the rule, not the exception here. 
we performed a bioinformatics survey of hundreds of bacteria, just a few of which I'm showing here, some of the proteobacteria. And what you can see is that bacteria tend to harbor toxins that target a wide range of cellular structures, including the cell wall in circles, phospholipids in squares, et cetera. For a while, we just didn't think um, much about this, or we figured, I suppose it was just random. But when Caitlin LaCourse, a really talented micro graduate student joined the lab, she started thinking about it more deeply. And she considered several possibilities to explain the distribution of toxins among bacteria. The first is that maybe toxins target certain organisms better than others. But we actually don't think this is likely to be the case because toxin targets are very widely conserved and studies by our group and others have shown that they target bacterial species very broadly. We also considered resistance. Uh, this we reasoned is unlikely as well because the targets of toxins are very difficult to modify. And because the number of toxins delivered are quite high in many cases, sometimes over 10, and evolving resistance to that many toxins seems improbable. <clears throat> A third possibility is conditional toxicity. For example, as shown here, that an effector works better with one solute concentration than another. This seemed like a reasonable idea given the rapidly changing environments the bacteria encounter at the micron scale. Finally, we considered that toxins might act synergistically. For example, where toxins acting individually are not very efficacious, but are highly active when they act together. This also seemed like a reasonable idea. And so we, we devised a screen to test these latter two possibilities. <clears throat> In short, what Caitlin did is she generated a panel of uniquely barcoded Pseudomonas aeruginosa strains susceptible to each type six accretion toxin, which we call TSE proteins, or all combinations of two. She could then grow this library with an excess of a donor strain for all six toxins and ask how each strain fares in a quantitative way by deep sequencing. This generated a lot of data, as you can imagine. Um, for conditional toxicity, I will just say that we indeed found it was very prevalent and that activity could be altered dramatically over tenfold in many cases by changing parameters that we think are certainly in flux in environments inhabited by bacteria. I did wanna share a little of our synergy data. Uh, we present this as the observed activity of the two toxins over the expected. So if data fall in this green region, that means that the two toxins were synergistic. A one is perfectly additive. And if they reside in this red area, that means that the activity of the two toxins was actually less than the activity of just the most potent of the two by itself. Many toxin pairs behave like TSE2 and TSE4 here, <clears throat> where the activity of the two toxins was similar to the additive values of the two toxins by themselves. What was uh, really interesting and super cool though, was that we also observed instances of strong synergy. For example, here with TSC4 and TSC6, which are highly synergistic under a range of conditions. At this time, we knew what TSC6 does, which is that it acts as an, uh, um, to degrade NAD in the target cell cytoplasm. But given these and other findings, Caitlin decided to investigate the function of TSE4, which we had no mechanistic information on at that time. <clears throat> and what Caitlin found is that TSE4 intoxication leads to a high degree of sensitivity to monovalent cations, like sodium and lithium, as you can see here in these center spots of TSE4 intoxicated cells. Furthermore, she showed using ICP that TSE4 intoxication results in a rapid release of potassium from cells, but not the release of larger solutes. From this and other data I don't have time to share, we think that um, TSC4 is a pore forming toxin that generates cation selective channels. So why then do TSC4 and TSC6 act synergistically? Um, we speculate that TSC4 and TSC6 are sort of a, a double whammy for cells. The influx of cations catalyzed by TSC4 cannot be combated due to the difficulty of maintaining cellular ATP with low NAD levels. The uh, cool thing was that when we look back at our genomic analyses of toxin distribution, 
what we see is that TSC4 and TSC6 co-occur more often than random chance, as we might expect. <clears throat> so we've been talking about all of these ultra-toxic proteins that kill competing cells, but in the second story I wanted to tell you about, we learned that uh, cell death is not the only important outcome of toxin delivery. And this story began with Brooke Peterson in the lab noting a bioinformatics report that suggested large and diverse groups of predicted deaminase toxins could be operating in bacteria and associated with toxin delivery systems, shown in purple here in this dendrogram. Deaminases act on all sorts of substrates, but the substrates of these deaminases were unknown and could not be predicted from sequence. Just in case you aren't familiar with these, these enzymes, I'm showing schematically here how one type of deaminase, those that act on cytosine, can mutate DNA. Cytosine deamination produces uracil, leading to GU mismatches. If these are not repaired, typically by the base excision repair pathway, and the replication fork passes through, this can lead to CG to TA transitions in daughter cells. Uh, we were intrigued by this as we thought, what if these deaminases mutate the genome of target cells? First, that would be really weird um, and, and an unexpected activity for a toxin. And second, maybe if a toxin with mutagenic activity didn't kill a cell, that cell would be left with the remnants of the trauma on its genome. <clears throat> One of these uh, predicted deaminases was found in the bacterium Ber Burkholderia senosopatia, a pathogen that affects people with cystic fibrosis, which is a disease we think a lot about in my lab. Furthermore, this B-sen toxin turned out to be a likely substrate of the type 6 secretion system. And sure enough, when we express the toxin domain of this protein, which I'll henceforth refer to as DDBA in E. coli cells, <clears throat> the viability of these cells dropped precipitously. This was a unique feature of this deaminase, as expression of a variety of other deaminases, including those that target single-stranded DNA, like A3G here, um, had no effect on cell viability. This experiment showed that uh, DDDA was indeed toxic, but it didn't get us any closer to knowing what its substrate was. At this point, it could have been DNA, RNA, nucleotides, or any number of other metabolites. So Marco Stamorais, the postdoc who led this work, had a very challenging problem on his hands, and he hunted for the substrate of DDDA for quite some time. Um, finally, we were uh, pulling our hair out, and one day Marco got a result suggesting that DDDA could be genotoxic. He therefore tested cytosine deaminase activity against single-stranded DNA, the substrate of all known cytosine deaminases to date. And he tested this over and over, but as you can see here, DDDA failed to produce a product in these assays. As a positive control, we use APOBAC3A. We knew from these results that DDDA didn't target single-stranded DNA like other deaminases. So one day, Marcos threw in double-stranded DNA on a whim. And the result was, as you can see here, very different. He saw robust cytosine deamination activity of this substrate which is why we went on to name the enzyme DDDA for double-stranded DNA deaminase A. Um, in retrospect, of course, um, this makes a lot of sense when thinking about DDDA as an interbacterial toxin. Um, double-stranded DNA is the form that most DNA is in in cells, and so this means a higher substrate concentration for DDDA in vivo than if it targeted single-stranded DNA. <clears throat> And upon discovering the uh, double-strand DNA deaminase activity of DDDA, we immediately realized the enzyme's potential for genome ed editing and eventually got in touch with David Liu at the Broad Institute. This collaboration turned out to be fruitful and, and, and a lot of fun. And I'd like to just briefly touch more conceptually on what we did together and where it's gone since. So if you wanna edit um, nuclear DNA, Two of the most popular methods are via tail proteins, which have repeats that can be programmed to bind specific DNA sequences, 
or one can use Cas-related proteins such as Cas9. For this application, people generally prefer Cas9, um, owing at least in part to the ease at which it can, with which it can be programmed. <clears throat> uh, David's lab has further pioneered fusing deaminases to dead Cas9 proteins, such that single and defined base pair substitutions can be inserted at specific locations in the genome. The situation is different, though, for the mitochondrial portion of the genome. <clears throat> the mitochondrial translocation system will not allow the transport of nucleic acids. Therefore, the Cas9 nucleoprotein complex is not tolerated. However, if tail proteins are fused to a mitochondrial localization sequence, they are tolerated, and people have exploited this by building tail nuclease fusions that are programmed to bind mitochondrial disease alleles. Upon recognizing the alleles, the nuclease acts, resulting in the destruction of problematic mitochondrial genome sequences and adjusting the heteroplasmic population towards favorable alleles. An improvement on this targeted destruction method would be a more fine-tuned editing approach, for example, by fusing deaminases to tail proteins and editing deleterious alleles. But of course, all previously characterized deaminases require single-stranded DNA. That's why they work with Cas9 proteins, because Cas9 generates a single-stranded bubble that deaminases can act on. Tail proteins bind the double helix, bind the double helix and do not generate uh, single-stranded DNA. So I hope you can see that in this regard, DDDA presented us with a unique opportunity to edit mitochondrial DNA using tails as targeting moieties. And so, great, uh, we'll just fuse DDDA to a mitochondrial targeted tail that's programmed to bind near a disease allele and it should work, right? Um, of course, the problem is that DDDA is a very toxic protein. That's, and that's precisely what we saw when we expressed tail DDDA fusions. However, um, our lab had solved the crystal structure of DDDA, and from this, David's lab was able to generate a split form of DDDA and fuse these halves to, tail, uh, to tails programmed to bind adjacent sites that flank regions of interest in the mitochondrial genome. Incredibly enough, uh, this actually worked and worked well, along with quite a few other bells and whistles that I'm not showing here. We no longer observe toxicity, and we could achieve upward of 50% and, and, and editing at certain loci. For example, at the mitochondrial ND4 locus I'm showing here. In this case, there is a nuclear pseudogene that differs by only a single mismatch in the tail binding region, shown here in red. And editing at this site was almost negligible. And depending on the particular tail DDDA fusion, we observe little to no off-target activity on the mitochondrial genome. We could also um, detect phenotypic changes, for example, a decrease in complex one, but not complex four activity, dependent on our edits to ND4, which encodes a, um, a subunit of complex one. This, this was a really fun offshoot of the, of the basic biology we typically do in my lab. And again, I really wanna thank David Liu and the graduate student in his lab who really drove, drove the genome editing side of things, Beverly Mock. And I also wanna acknowledge Vamsi Mutha and Anna Kotris um, in his lab for their work characterizing the consequences of mitochondrial mutations. And I'm really uh, happy to report that this technology has now um, only eight months or so after a publication been used, been used to introduce for the first time mitochondrial mutations in mice, which I find uh, quite remarkable, uh, the pace at which this has gone forward. Um, in this case, the authors introduced a mutation that could, um, that could allow researchers to model Lay syndrome, which is linked to mutations in the mitochondrial gene ND5, also part of complex one. The authors showed successful germline transmission and widespread tissue distribution of the mutations, as you can see um, from this graph from their manuscript derived from an F1 mouse. Moving forward, um, I think DDDA-based mitochondrial genome editing holds a great deal of promise. 
But in my remaining time, um, I wanted to return to our original motivation for going after this toxin in the first place, which was that we were looking for a toxin that might mutate recipient cells. Now we have found something with that biochemical activity, and so we wanted to see if that actually happens in vivo. One of the first things we tested was whether DDDA expressed in E. coli could introduce mutations. And the way we score this is using, is using the frequency by which resistance to the antibiotic rifampicin arises. Sure enough, what we found is that at sublethal levels relative to a catalytically inactive variant, DDDA raised the frequency of resistance to rifampicin. In the typical repair process in the cell, uracil incorporation is mitigated by an enzyme called uracil DNA glycosylase, or UNG. And we reasoned that if we mutated this enzyme, we should be able to exacerbate the mutagenic effects of DDDA. And as you can see here, that's precisely what we observed. And this last set of bars is just the genetic complementation of this mutant. In other experiments, we sequenced the genomes of E. coli strains exposed to DDDA for multiple generations. And here are the results of that work. Control strains had virtually no mutations, whereas these strains bore several hundred, which were seemingly randomly distributed um, across the genome, and nearly all were the expected CG to TA transitions. And there's one more observation from these experiments that's worth noting, which is that <clears throat> if we aligned each of the mutated cytosines, we observed a clear and simple preferred sequence context of DDDA, where the cytosine is preceded by a thymidine. So DDDA can indeed act as a potent mutagen, uh, but this was obviously under circumstances of heterologous expression, which is, which is not physiological. Therefore, we next expose recipient bacteria to BSEN wild type or BSEN encoding catalytically inactive DDDA from the native DDDA chromosomal locus. And what we found is that some recipients were susceptible to DDDA, while others appeared entirely resistant to the toxin. Susceptible bacteria included pseudomonads and other Burkholderia. You can see this by comparing the first two bars in each set here, that these bacteria showed competitive in indices sensitive to the activity of DDDA. On the other hand, resistant bacteria included pathogenic and non-pathogenic E. coli and the closely related bacteria in Klebsiella pneumoniae. Our assumption was that these bacteria <clears throat> that are resistant to the toxin were likely just not good targets for type 6 based delivery of toxins by BSEN. But we got a hint that this was wrong when we looked at RIF resistance frequency within surviving populations. The increase um, in mutation frequency shown here for EHAC suggested that the toxin indeed had reached recipient cells. To further investigate this, we conducted whole genome sequencing on several RIF resistant isolates of each strain. These um, were peppered with mutations, confirming that DDDA delivered by the type 6 secretion system of BSEN is in fact able to mutate recipient cells, as we had observed in our heterologous expression experiments. So far, we've only observed these mutations within bacteria belonging to populations whose overall viability is not impacted by the toxin. We speculate that at very low quantities, perhaps just one or two molecules, <clears throat> of the toxin are required to kill a cell, and that in sensitive populations, the few molecules delivered run rampant, whereas in resistant bacteria, we suspect that the toxin is inactivated, perhaps by degradation, before it is able to kill the cell, leading in many cases to the accumulation of mutations. That's something we're looking into currently, but in any case, it does bring us full circle to that motivation I started with, which was to ask whether there might be outcomes beyond cell death for cells targeted by the type 6 secretion system? The answer is clearly yes, and we think the ramifications of this could be significant, as I'll discuss with you in just a moment. But first, I do want to leave you with one more observation. And here's another more detailed look at that phylogeny of deaminases. I've boxed families with members that are likely bacterial toxins. 
And what we've been got what what we've begun doing is asking what sort of activities these other families might possess. Specifically, we've investigated two families, which we've named bacterial deaminase toxin families two and three, or BAD, TF two and three, following the family of DDBA, which we named BAD TF one. I just briefly want to share with you a few of our results, as I think they speak to the fascinating biochemical diversity of bacterial toxins, and I think they bode well for defining new useful uh, biotechnology tools. We did the same type of analysis with these toxins as we performed with DDDA, and remarkably, despite their sequence divergence from DDDA, both function as cytosine deaminases. What's interesting is that the specificity of these toxins differs from DDDA and also from each other. For example, bad TF2 prefers to edit cytosines flanked by other cytosines, but it's really rather promiscuous and will even act on cytosines preceded by purines. And the plot thickens when we look at the biochemical activity of this enzyme in vitro. Unlike DDDA, bad TF2 exhibits some activity against double-stranded DNA, but it actually prefers single-stranded DNA as a substrate. We speculate that the promiscuity of this bad TF2 member, which we now refer to as SSDA, is a necessary trade-off in vivo for its preferred activity against single-stranded DNA. And our hope uh, moving forward is that we find even more biochemical diversity in deaminases, which can be fed into our efforts to further develop genome editing tools. And so to wrap up, um, I hope you agree with me that studying mi microscale warfare stands to tell us quite a lot, both helping us understand basic questions about the behavior of microbes in nature and in the sense that the molecular components un underlying the phenomenon can have applicability in um, biotechnology, which is an old concept, really. <clears throat> We're excited about DDDA and related uh, deaminases, as we think that the source of mutations in nature isn't terribly well understood, and that directly mutagenic toxins could, could be more important in this process than we realized. Of course, we have lots left unanswered at this stage. Why are some bacteria resistant to DDDA? And why do these bacteria accumulate mutations? Uh, Marcos in the lab is <clears throat> on the job market currently, and these are questions he wants to answer once he establishes his own lab. One thing we're excited about is whether we can use the genomic signatures left by DDDA and other deaminases to reconstruct the history of mitochondrial, uh, sorry, uh, microbial encounters. And finally, going back to the first study on toxin diversity, um, if you know, if, if nature is selected for certain combinations of toxin activities over the eons, can we learn from this when formulating our own antibacterial combinations? And so I thanked some folks along the way, but um, I really would be remiss not to again mention Dr. Brooke Peterson, a senior scientist in my lab, for all of her contributions, which cannot be overstated to all of the work I told you about today. Those first few slides, uh, as I said, were years of work in the lab, and many, many people contributed hugely to those er early discoveries. <clears throat> and many people beyond those I highlighted during the talk contributed directly to the stories um, I detailed today. Caitlin had help from Hemantha Kulasekara, Matthew Rady, and Rachel Kim in the lab, and Marcos had help from Foshang Shu, Dustin Bosch, Jun Zhang, um, Hannah Ledvina and Jacob Frick. And I also wanted to acknowledge uh, collaborators outside of our lab on that work, including our longstanding collaborator, Paul Wiggins in the physics department and Dean Huang in his lab. Noah Simon in the biostatistics department helped us out with establishing confidence in the activity of DDDA and target cells. And I also wanted to use this opportunity to give special thanks to some folks. Um, first, Carrie Harwood, who nominated me for this talk and has been uh, extremely supportive of our program here at UW. And then I would also just like to thank um, all the folks at UW who have been great collaborators over the years. I'm not going to name them all here, but I've listed you out. I hope I, I didn't miss anyone. If I did, my apologies. You know who you are. Thank you so much. And 
Lastly, of course, I want to thank all current members of the lab for their for their hard work and resilience uh, throughout this pandemic. Thank you. Yeah, Joseph, really uh, fascinating. Uh, I remember the enthusiasm uh, that Jim Shampoo spoke of you with, you know, when you were first being recruited. Um, that uh, enthusiasm, um, I, I mean, um, you've re you've rewarded his, his enthusiasm. I think it's just wonderful to see this, both for the biology uh, that you and the group has disco have discovered uh, and, and the uh, applications yet to come, as well as uh, further biological discoveries. I, I really do appreciate this, and I've... Uh, enjoyed the opportunity to, to see the work that you and the lab have been doing. Um, Chip Asbury has a question here that you uh, might have seen. Um, it's kind of how does a snake avoid uh, its own toxin? How do the bacteria that produce DDA for deployment against their enemies avoid its toxicity? And how do they avoid making mutations to their own genomes? Yes, that's a great question, and I, I sort of um, intentionally excluded that concept from the talk um, <laughs> to simplify it a little bit, um, but uh, they protect themselves using immunity proteins, um, cognate immunity proteins that bind to the toxins very tightly, uh, typically in the active site, and, and, and block their activity, and, right. and DDDA is no exception to that. Um, let's see, do we have another? Um, how do the toxins enter the receptive cells being killed? Um, is the toxin just released into free space and then receptive cells allow it to enter through endocytosis? Yes, that's a good question and, and another kind of concept that I <laughs> left out of the talk. Um, and, um, and that sort of relates to the sort of the structure function of the type 6 secretion delivery system. And um, basically, toxins are sort of thrust through the um, outer membrane of target cells by a phage-like apparatus. <clears throat> so that's how they reach target cells. And then how they get through the inner membrane is, is um, less well understood, I would say. Yeah, that was part of Jim's excitement way back then. It was kind of a, a syringe that could uh, inject these toxins into another bacterium. Um, so, so just really great to see. You. I've enjoyed this. Um, any other questions? Um, if not, uh, Joseph and the group, uh, one more thank. Thanks very much, and uh, we'll all go out and enjoy some sun sh sunshine, maybe. So, thank, thank you me. very much. Thanks for the opportunity. See y'all. Bye bye.